evening. Uh, welcome to DMD Optimized, <laughs> part of the D4 network. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and Dragons 5e. We theorycraft about them, we crunch numbers, and basically try to create a character that is both really fun and also really powerful to play in game. So, if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, then welcome home. This is absolutely where you belong, and I'm super happy to have you here, so thanks for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. If you would like a written step-by-step -step guide to this and all of my other builds, please consider joining the channel. As a member, there should be a little button down there in the corner for only $2 a month you get access to my library of write-ups, which I create for each episode. So you can have a step-by-step -step guide to recreate the character yourself uh, if you would like. Of course, in addition to that, it's a great way to support the channel. Thanks for being here, even if you don't feel like you can or want to become a member. I still appreciate having you. So let's jump into the episode this week. Ever since the Dampier was first announced several months ago in the Unearthed Arcana, I've been wanting to try to build a character around it. I figured with Halloween coming up this week, at the time of recording anyway, now was the perfect time to try and do so. As an aside, it is a very dark and blustery day out there, which is very fitting for the theme, but it is giving me fits with my lighting. All right, so typically, when I do a build around a particular weapon or race, I like to try to find what is unique about that particular thing and make it a focal point of the build. The question that I ask myself is, you know, what can this weapon or race or spell sometimes do that maybe others can't and try to find a way to optimize a character around that in a way that takes advantage of that thing's uniqueness in a way that's powerful because of the thing that makes it different. Like, how the whip is the only melee finesse weapon with reach or the dart is the only ranged weapon with the thrown property the thing about the dampier that's most unique i think is their vampiric bite having a natural weapon isn't all that special but the fact that the attack that you make with it uses your constitution modifier instead of your strength or something else for your plus to hit and your damage is quite unique in D&D. &D. So for me, when I look at the Dampier, this is the thing that I want to build the character around. Now, if we are building a character who wants to emphasize their constitution score above all else, to me, that says that this character would probably make a pretty good tank. Now, for the uninitiated, when we talk about tanks, right, we're talking about characters who are durable, who are hard to kill, but who also protect their allies, usually by finding ways to direct enemy attacks towards them instead of towards their friends, since they're so much more durable. Now, survivability is maybe the most important aspect of a tank, I think, and the higher our constitution, the better our survivability, right? What's more, the Dampier's Vampiric Bite can also be empowered so that it heals you, among other things. So now we're potentially really doubling down on that survivability aspect, since it both heals us and to get the most out of it, we're bumping the stat that makes us beefier, right? So that is going to be the focus for our Dampier build today. This is not a wafy Count Dracula that we're building, and in fact, I'll admit the thumbnail might have been just a little bit clickbaity, because <laughs> I don't know that we're necessarily trying to build like the quintessential, as you might think of them in popular culture, vampire necessarily, right? Unless you're thinking about a sort of Vlad the Impaler archetype vampire, replete in full plate mail, leading your allies into battle, striking fear into your foes, yes, draining their life force to sustain your own, yes, being near impossible to kill, as most vampires are, yes, but not the blah blah blah, I want to suck your blood type. <laughs> <laughs> and so, let's jump into the build. I present episode 64, The Ultimate 
vampire. And a big shout out, as usual, to my friend Randall Hampton uh, for his artwork for this particular character concept. I absolutely love it. It's super like dark and also menacing looking. I love the spikes on the shield. It looks exactly like I imagined what this character would look like. So thanks, Randall. If you want to follow him, check out how to do so in the video description. He is, last I checked, open for commissions and does fantastic work. So anyway, here we go at level one. For our class, I want to start off here as a fighter for a number of reasons, which I will get into as we go. As for the race, or lineage of course, I, su I suppose, we're going with Dampyr, here's what we read about the Dampyr. Poised between the worlds of the living and the dead, Dampyrs retain their grip on life, yet are endlessly tested by vicious hungers. Their ties to the undead grant Dampyrs a taste of a vampire's deathless prowess in the form of increased speed, dark vision, and a life-draining bite. With unique insights into the nature of the undead, many Dampyrs become adventurers and monster hunters. Their reasons are often deeply personal. Some seek danger, imagining monsters as personifications of their own hungers. Others pursue revenge against whatever turned them into a Dampyr. And still others embrace the solitude of the hunt, striving to distance themselves from those who tempt their hunger. Obviously, you're going to want to think about what it was that caused you to become a Dampyr. Did you start off as a different race? Probably, right? And then take on this lineage somehow. And what is it that motivates your character now that you have undergone this transformation? So as a Dampyr, we have dark vision. We don't need to breathe. We have a climb speed equal to our walking speed, which is super cool. Uh, and that's 35 feet, by the way, which is nice. And at third level, we can move up down, across vertical surfaces, and even upside down on ceilings without using our hands. And that's just totally creepy and awesome, and I love it. And then of course we also get our vampiric bite. Let's discuss the details now. So your fanged bite is a natural weapon. It counts as a simple melee weapon. It deals only a 1d4 of damage, but it uses, like I've said, our constitution modifier for attacks, as I've mentioned. In addition, while we're missing half or more of our hit points, we have advantage with the attack, which is really cool, but it's a little difficult to work around, I think. Since you don't typically want to like intentionally keep your own hit points low, especially if you are a character who's focused on survivability, right? Um, that said, if you're doing your job and actually directing a lot of attacks your way, you might be at less than half hit points semi-frequently and therefore able to take advantage of the advantage. So right off the bat, the fact that this attack does more damage if you make yourself more durable is totally cool and really pretty powerful, despite that little d4 weapon die. But of course, it gets better. Because when you attack with the bite on anything that's not a construct or an undead, you can empower that bite in one of two ways. Either to heal you for amount equal to the piercing damage dealt by the bite, that's important, or give you a bonus to your next ability check or attack roll equal to the piercing damage dealt by the bite. I can see that latter option coming in handy sometimes if we were building around a burst or nova damage character who really wanted to ensure that they land their next attack because it's going to hit for a boatload of damage or something, we actually potentially might make use of this later uh, to improve one of our ability checks, which I'll talk about shortly. But I'm not going to focus on this aspect of the bite otherwise. So let's talk about that self-heal a little bit. Being healed for the amount of piercing damage the attack does is nice but it is a bit restrictive. If we, for example, like wanted to take Paladin level so that we could add Divine Smite to the attack, Smite Bite? Ooh, Divine Bite. The damage from Divine Smite would not heal us for any more because Divine Smite is radiant damage, right? What we need if we want to increase the amount that we heal from this attack is to find ways to add damage that simply does either specifically piercing damage or the same type of damage as the initial weapon attack. So those are the types of things that we're going to be looking for as we level up to make this bite and therefore the heal from it as potent as possible. 
Now, of course, we need to mention here the big bummer about this ability, which is that it's only usable a number of times per day equal to our proficiency bonus, the, the empowered aspect of the bite. You can bite as often as you want. You can't heal from it more than proficiency bonus times per day. That's kind of a bummer. I, I wish that we could heal more often. You know, having a more sustainable self-heal would definitely increase our survivability. I wish that it would at least reset on a short rest, but you know, anyway, when you're when you're building a character around a particular theme and you restrict yourself in the name of staying true to that character idea or concept, sometimes you have to make sacrifices. Our goal, of course, is to optimize around the restrictions that we've been given in the name of creating a viable, fun to play vampire or vampire-esque character, not necessarily to just try to make the best tank ever or the most durable character imaginable. And this, unfortunately, is actually going to be a little bit of a theme for this character, which I'll get into in a couple of levels, but that doesn't mean that we can't create a character that is both potent and powerful and fun. As for our ability scores, I'm going to recommend that we start with a 14 constitution and take our plus two from our lineage there, so we have 16, a 15 strength and our plus one there, so we also have a 16 in our strength, and then a 13 wisdom and a 13 dexterity. Unfortunately, there's no feat that we're planning on taking that's going to also bump our constitution, no half feat that gives us a constitution bump. So starting with an odd number in our constitution doesn't make a lot of sense. Also, even though I'm not planning on using strength-based attacks once we get our constitution score up, I am going to want a decent strength score, both so as not to suffer any move speed penalty uh, from wearing heavy armor, which I'm planning on doing, but also for something that we're going to discuss in a minute. As for equipment, yes, um, you know, pretty standard stuff. I just start with like chain mail, make sure you get a shield and probably like a D8 weapon of your choice. For now, when you're not empowering your bite, you will want to use that D8 weapon for your attacks because your strength and your constitution are both 16. One thing that I'll mention quickly, I don't often talk about backgrounds or what proficiencies you should take when you're creating your character. Just make sure for this one, you take proficiency in athletics. And we'll get into why in a minute, though most of you can probably guess. And then of course, as a fighter at level one, we get the second wind ability, which tells us that once per short rest as a bonus action, we can heal ourselves for a D10 plus our fighter level. That's especially nice for someone focused on survivability. And then we also get a fighting style. Interception would make you a better protector of your allies as it lets you use your reaction to reduce damage to a friend within five feet of you when they're hit. And that might be the way to go here, especially since we, unlike most other tanks that I build, aren't going to have a this works all the time on your turn way to encourage enemies to attack you instead of your allies. More on that in a minute. That said, since we're focusing on pushing our own survivability as far as we can, I'm going to assume that we're taking the defense fighting style here to give us a plus one to our armor class while we are wearing armor. At level two, we get action surge, which is great. Once per short rest, it lets us take an entire another action on our turn. No additional bonus action, but just a whole nother action. And that's useful in pretty much every single build, including this one. At level three, we get our subclass, our martial archetype. And I considered a few options here, actually. Cavalier gives us a reliable taunt that any good tank wants more on that in a second. Rune Knight was actually a very strong consideration, and I'm sorely tempted to take it even now, as it has some really fun protection, uh, control, and damage options that would synergize particularly well, I think, with a Dampier, as some of the runes that you get as a Rune Knight have a difficulty check which is enhanced by your constitution score and you could also grow to grapple larger creatures than you otherwise would would be able to among other things but for me the subclass that fits best here is the battle master and i'll explain why as a battle master we learn a certain number of combat maneuvers that we can use to enhance our attacks or do other things to gain superiority on the battlefield, right? Those are fueled by superiority dice, of which we have four per short rest right now, and they are D8s. I'm going to talk about two maneuvers in particular that I think we need to pick up here. Goading attack and grappling strike. Something that I that I haven't gotten 
too into yet, but that I always talk about in all of my tank builds, right? It is important as a tank to have a way to encourage your enemies to attack you instead of your allies, right? I refer to these types of abilities as taunts, though that's mostly a video game term, I think. Usually in D&D, these abilities come in the form of giving disadvantage to your enemies if they attack anyone other than you. Our Dampier vampire doesn't have anything like that yet, and thus, goading attack. When you hit an enemy with a weapon attack, and remember, our bite counts as a simple weapon, you add one of your superiority dice to the damage roll and force the target to make a wisdom saving throw. If they fail, they have disadvantage on attacks against anyone other than you until your next turn. I wish this lasted longer. I wish there was no saving throw involved. I wish we could do it more often. But first of all, this and all combat maneuvers that add damage to our attacks have the very fantastic benefit of adding weapon damage to our attacks. Meaning if our weapon is piercing damage, the damage added is piercing. Meaning that if we empower our bite, we will heal for more if we add a goading attack to it. That is a nice boon to our survivability, obviously. So even though we have a limited number of uses for both our empowered bite and our combat maneuvers, the goading attack here. We're going to lean into them regardless because they both help us fulfill both of our priorities as a tank. Durability, in this case via self-healing, and taunting, or encouraging your enemies to attack you instead of your allies. As for the grappling strike, I think that since our taunt feature is limited in use, this character is going to be wanting to grapple a lot. And this, by the way, is the main reason for taking a high strength score, as grappling a target requires you to use one of your attacks, have at least one free hand, which we can have if we're biting with our attacks, even if we're holding a shield, right? And make an athletics check. And so that's why we wanted to make sure we had athletics as one of our proficiencies when we were creating our character at level one. I suppose you could argue that in a way, grappling a target is almost the best taunt in D&D, since you know, imposing disadvantage on an enemy when they attack someone other than you isn't really forcing them to attack you, right? But on the other hand, reducing an enemy's speed to zero, which is what happens when you grapple them successfully, and then dragging them away from your allies, which you can do at half your move speed once you've grappled them, and getting them like out of reach of your ally, makes it much less likely that they'll be attacking that ally, right? Even if they are a ranged enemy and they decide to attack your ally from, from range, if they're grappled, that means they're within five feet of you, and so they're going to have disadvantage on that attack, which is basically the same thing that we would try to accomplish with a taunt. And if the enemy tries to break that grapple, they have to spend an action trying to make an athletics or acrobatics check against your athletics check. They get to choose. But even if they succeed, they spent their turn doing that, which typically means they're not going to be attacking anyone on their turn, and that's way better than attacking someone with disadvantage. So yeah, it's a great way to protect your allies, potentially. Of course, on the other hand, if you have other melee allies, and the target that you're grappling is the only target for that melee ally to attack, or, or it's the target that they really want to attack for whatever reason, then grappling them isn't going to do much to keep your melee allies safe, because, you know, if your melee ally is next to the target that you have grappled, they can simply make an attack against that melee ally of yours with no sort of disadvantage. Grappling does not impose disadvantage. It's not the same thing as being restrained. And so that's why I think it's important that we have something like goading attack. And why I ultimately decided not to go with Rune Knight, as they don't have anything like goading attack, right? As great as the other features that they have are. Anyway, if we're going to be grappling, it might be nice to have something that enhances your grapples. Grappling Strike tells us that after we hit an enemy with a melee attack, like Vampiric Bite, for example, you can expend a superiority die and try to grapple them as a bonus action instead of as an attack, right? Adding the superiority die to our athletics check. So that's 
both great for our action economy, but also to increase the likelihood of successfully grappling somebody. So great to use, especially on an enemy that we feel probably has a high athletics or acrobatics check to resist our grapple check. And I mean, of course, it's 100% on point for our Vlad or Vladette to be grappling their target when they're biting them, right? I mean, how could you not? Speaking of character appropriate things, it would be fun to have, I think, menacing attack as a maneuver as well, since that lets you do extra damage to your target and, barring a saving throw, cause them to be frightened of you as well, and everybody's afraid of vampires. At level 4, we get our first ability score increase or feat. I think, obviously, we need to bump our constitution here so that we're at an 18 constitution, and I think at this point I would probably just be using my bite attack on pretty much every single attack that I make, even if it's not empowered, unless it were against a very low enemy armor class or you had a nice magic weapon, which seems a little unlikely at level 4, but not impossible. Speaking of, let me mention this here because it's important. One of the biggest downsides of your bite attack is that it isn't a magic weapon. I would absolutely talk with your DM about what you're trying to do with your character here and figure out how big of a deal this is going to be for you. How often are you going to be running into enemies with resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage? Are you going to be able to get some sort of ability feature magic item that's going to let that bite become a magic weapon. There are a couple of ways to work around this, rules as written. Going Kensei Monk could eventually get you magical attacks with your bite, not to mention scaling damage that could go all the way up to a d10 for your bite attack. Not bad. Moon Druid is another alternative, but I don't think that either Monk or Druid is the right path for this particular Dampier build that I'm making. Certain spells like magic weapon or even artificer infusion might work but jeremy crawford has indicated in a tweet a few years ago that for purposes of like the magic weapon spell for example it's intended to work on a magic item not a body part your dm may disagree of course the easiest way i think around the problem would be with a magic item like insignia of the claws that enhances your natural weapons among other things and makes them magical. I have to believe that most DMs are going to be willing to work with you on this and help you navigate this potential problem. But again, something that you're gonna to wanna to talk with them about sooner rather than later. And by sooner, I mean like before you even start playing this character in their campaign. At level five, we get extra attack and attacking twice per turn is better than once. We would no longer have to choose between grappling a target or making a bite attack and or an empowered goading bite attack. We could do both in our single attack action, which is great, and even do a goading attack on one target and grapple a second, thus uh, potentially focusing the fire of two enemies on you instead of your allies, and that's great. At level six, there is another class that I would like to visit with this build, but even if it might be a little bit boring, the fact that fighters get more ability score increases or feats than any other class, and a second one so early at level 6 is enough to make me stick around, as doing so gets our constitution capped at 20, which is great for everything we want to do. Damage, which also means healing, which means better survivability, not to mention the better survivability that a better constitution score innately brings us. I love getting multiple important benefits for a character with a single ability score. And so, at level 6, it's time for our first damage report. Let's talk about tactics and assumptions. At this point in our career, over the course of a fight, we could potentially empower our bite attack three times, as our proficiency bonus is three now. Assuming we added a goading attack to each of them, or some other maneuver that added damage, but I'll assume goading attack since, again, we want to encourage the enemy to attack us instead of our allies, with a 20 constitution, each empowered bite would do 1d4 for the bite, plus 1d8 for the superiority die, plus five for a constitution modifier and all of it would be considered piercing damage. So that's on average 12 hit points of damage and 12 hit points of healing whenever we combine all of those things together. And yeah, if we did that three times over the course of a fight, we could potentially heal ourselves for 36 hit points on average. You would at that point still have one superiority die left, which you could use for a grappling strike if you wanted or simply a fourth goading attack, though it would be unempowered for healing purposes. You could actually do 
all of this in one turn if you really wanted to burn action surge and all of your resources right at once empowered goading bite on one enemy extra attack repeat that do the same thing on a second enemy action surge repeat it on a third enemy and then for your fourth and final attack use grappling strike and then grapple them with your bonus action if grappling strike hits Assuming, of course, that you have the move speed to reach four different enemies in one turn and that you're willing to risk any potential opportunity attacks that might be coming your way as a result. I don't think it likely, but it's a fun image seeing this, this vampire type character clad in plate armor, which I assume that you have at this point, by the way, darting between multiple enemies, bolstering your own life with the blood of your victims, enraging all of them to attack you because you're obviously the biggest threat on the battlefield and they're really mad about the blood that you took from them, and finally even grab grasping a fourth foe in your clutches to drink their blood and keep them from reaching your friends. You would have expended most of your resources by doing that, but man, it would be a glorious round of combat. As for how we report on numbers for tank builds, as a reminder for some of you, I pit my tanks against three theoretical combat situations at levels 6, 9, 13, and 17 that are meant to simulate a boss fight, a typical fight, and then a fireball. I always assume when I crunch these numbers that we have whatever resources we need for survivability available to us. I do this for every tank build when I crunch numbers, whether it's the shield spell if you're a caster or key points if you're a monk or rage uses if you're a barbarian, etc. But then I calculate how much damage we would take in one round pitted against that made up encounter. That number we call damage taken per round or DTPR. And then we calculate how many rounds the character would survive at that rate of damage specifically and call that rounds to die or RTD. It's an imperfect system. It's a bit oversimplified, doesn't necessarily perfectly simulate how combat is going to go in D&D, but I find it somewhat useful to make general assumptions of my tank builds when I try and compare them to each other. So yes, for our purposes, I'm assuming that we will be able to heal ourselves for 36 hit points. And if that's flawed, then at least you can rest assured that I'm consistent in the application of that flaw. And so, at level 6, damage report. For our boss fight, we are going up against a young white dragon, and against that young white dragon, we would be taking, on average, 16 damage per round, 16 DTPR, and at that rate, we would survive for 7 rounds, 7 RTD. The typical fight at level 6 was against 4 berserkers, and our DTPR is 11, and our RTD is 10 and then against a level 3 dc 14 fireball our damage taken on average would be 22 and at that rate we would survive for five rounds so not amazing but not terrible uh, when compared to other tank builds that i've done and again you can check the video description for a link to a spreadsheet and graphs that do compare those tank builds to one another by comparison it's about average and that's not bad and sure, when you can't empower your bite anymore, your survivability is going to go down, but again, the same thing could be said for the caster tanks who run out of spell slots, or monk tanks who run out of key points, or barbarian tanks who run out of uses of rage. So, all right, the question now is, where do we go from here? I think there are two main things on our to-do list. One, find ways to enhance the damage of our bite attack. So as to enhance our self-healing and damage, of course. And two, find ways to enhance our grapple checks, as we're pretty dependent on that to keep our allies safe. I think the best way to accomplish both of those things at this point is to multi-class into... Any guesses? If you said Swords Bard, I think you should get an honorable mention. <laughs> I love Swords Bard for a damp here, I really do. Uh, defensive flourish would be really great to both add damage to our bite attack and increase our armor class. The main reasons I decided not to were one, our charisma is garbage, so we wouldn't get to flourish that often. And while we could have dumped dexterity and wisdom to get a higher charisma, dexterity and wisdom are just so much more important for saving throw purposes, I think, and on a character that's focused on their survivability, that felt important. And, and even with a 14 charisma, which is what we could get to, we could only flourish twice per day until bard level 5, and then it would be twice per short rest. That's a pretty hefty investment to be making into a d8 character who's trying to be a tank. Still, I think it worth considering. For me, I want to go ranger here. 
So at level seven, yes, we would be a ranger at level one. Now, why is your Dampier going ranger? Perhaps they are a bit of a loner and they want to get away from people. More likely, I would think they are perfecting their abilities as a hunter of prey. One nice advantage that they have over bards too is that they are a d10 hit die. It's one more hit point per level, but there is more to it than just that. So at ranger one, we get the canny ability from our deft explorer feature, which is one of the main draws for me for ranger because we get it right at level one assuming of course that we're using tasha's cauldron of everything this lets us double our proficiency bonus in one skill that we're proficient in this is essentially like having expertise but just for one skill instead of two right and we of course would take this in athletics making our grappling checks much more potent which was one of our most important priorities. Also, assuming that we're using Tasha's, we get Favored Foe at Ranger 1, which lets us mark a target proficiency bonus times per day, and upon marking them, we can increase the damage of our first attack we hit them with per turn by 1d4. It's not a ton, but there's no reason why this wouldn't stack with our Empowered Bite if we wanted to use it at this level. It does require your concentration, as if you were concentrating on a spell though, so I don't think we would get a ton of use out of this because at level 8 we would be a ranger level 2 and we get ranger spells, and there's several good ones here for us, a couple of which use our concentration. So first up, I want to talk about Hunter's Mark. It can be a really great spell, though I've actually shied away from it and from Hex in both my builds and my play, actually, for quite a while now, because not only does it require your concentration, but it's so bonus action dependent, right? Now, this character doesn't have a ton of uses for their bonus action currently, aside from things like Grappling Strike and Second Wind, uh, which are once in a while type things. And because it also adds piercing damage to our attack and should therefore stack when we enhance our bite for not only extra damage, but extra healing. Now, let me pause a moment here and acknowledge that I'm guessing there might be some of you watching this who would want to argue that the damage from Hunter's Mark would not, in fact, apply to the empowered bite. So let's briefly discuss that. The description for damp here says, if you empower the bite, you can regain hit points equal to the piercing damage dealt by the bite. Hunter's Mark says, you gain an extra 1d6 damage to the target whenever you hit it with a weapon attack, among other things. And the damage type is bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, depending on the weapon you're using, obviously. In my mind, and I think in most people's mind, that's all you need to tie the two together, right? That it adds to your weapon attack and it adds the same type of damage as your weapon attack does. I have seen some people argue, however, that a strict reading of the rules would say, no, Hunter's Mark is just adding damage to the bite attack. It's not increasing the damage of the bite attack and that's not the same thing. So you wouldn't get to heal from the extra damage from Hunter's Mark. To that argument, I would gently and very lovingly say, that's gobbledygook. <laughs> But I 100% support your right to argue the fact in the comment section below, which I invite you to do now. As for other spells to consider taking, I definitely say take Absorb Elements. Uh, as a reaction, we get to cast it to give us resistance to elemental damage types, basically, and then we get damage of that elemental type that we've resisted uh, on our next hit. I would also think about Cure Wounds or Goodberry, as more heal options are always nice, but my favorite for pure flavor and potential power would actually be Fog Cloud here. It requires an action to cast, it requires your concentration, so that would mean no Hunter's Mark, which is a bummer, but when you cast it, it creates a 20 foot radius sphere of fog centered on a point within 120 feet of you, and the area within is heavily obscured. That means, for those who don't know, unless you have a way to see outside of normal vision, like tremor sense or something, a creature within the area of that fog cloud is effectively blinded. That means that their attacks are made with disadvantage and attacks against them are made with advantage, so long as the one attacking them can see them. And guess what? As a ranger at level two, you also get a fighting style. And one of those fighting styles can be blind fighting. Now, you might wanna pick up something else like dueling, 
for when you're using a one-handed weapon, if you're using a one-handed weapon or druidic warrior to pick up a couple of useful druid cantrips. Um, guidance would especially be nice, I think, for our grapple checks, among other things. But the option of casting fog over my enemies and then haunting them as I dart between the shadows, falling on them to suck their blood, it's just too rich for this character, I think, to pass up. Because yes, with blind fighting, you have blind sight within a range of 10 feet. So you could see your enemies, even if they were heavily obscured by a cloud of fog, and thereby get advantage on your attacks against them. Not to mention it would really mess up their attacks that they're making against your allies, potentially. I would 100%, I think, use this combo occasionally with this character, but I'm not going to assume that we're doing so when I crunch the numbers because I want that extra damage and therefore healing from Hunter's Mark. You totally should though, if it sounds fun, just be really careful because of course, if your allies don't have blind fighting or something like it, this could really bum them out and potentially mess things up on the battlefield. So take that into consideration before you start stalking your prey in the fog. Ideally when there's a full moon and a wolf howling nearby. At level nine, we would be a ranger three. And again, assuming that we have access to Tasha's, we get primal awareness here, which at this level lets us cast speak with animals once per day without spending a spell slot. That seems especially fitting if the animal that you're talking to is a bat. And then of course we get our ranger archetype, our subclass. And I think there's a couple of good options here. Gloomstalker of course feels pretty appropriate thematically, but I think what would be even better for us numbers wise and sustainability wise, and also pretty spot on thematically, is just the good old fashioned hunter. I haven't used hunter for a long time. Here's what we read about them. Emulating the hunter archetype means accepting your place as a bulwark between civilization and the terrors of the wilderness. As you walk the hunter's path, you learn specialized techniques for fighting the threats you face, from rampaging ogres and hordes of orcs to towering giants and terrifying dragons. So yes, you are now becoming the supreme stalker of prey, which I think for a vampire-esque character is totally on point. So to that end, as a hunter, we get Hunter's Prey here at level three, which lets us choose between three different benefits. But I think the one that we are going to wanna to take is Colossus Slayer, which tells us that once per turn, when we hit a creature with a weapon attack, we can deal an extra 1d8 of damage with that weapon attack, so long as the creature is below full health. Again, I feel confident that this would stack with your empowered bite for the healing, as it's very clearly doing piercing damage here added to the attack. If you disagree, see my earlier comment about Hunter's Mark. I love you guys. You know that, right? You know that. And so for our level nine damage report, I'm going to assume that over the course of the fight, we are adding 1d6 from Hunter's Mark and a 1d8 from Hunter's Prey on all of our empowered bite attacks, assuming that we're just doing this all like once per turn, right? Over the course of an entire combat encounter, we potentially would have access to four empowered bites now since our proficiency bonus has gone up. That means I'm assuming that we're using all four of our superiority dice as well for goading attack to stack with the empowered bite to get the both the extra damage and the extra healing from using those simultaneously for a potential total of 80 healing over the course of a combat on average. Our armor class has not gone up, and that hurts, but we can have a total of 183 hit points over the course of the fight now when you include the self-healing. Now, just because I'm assuming we're not using grappling strike doesn't mean we shouldn't be grappling, right? Certainly, I'd likely be trying to grapple right from the beginning in round one. I'd just likely be grappling with my first attack and then using a goading attack for my second attack or vice versa. Oh, and we have a much better chance of landing that grappling attack now thanks to our canny ability, so that's nice. Also, I'm going to assume that you have absorb elements available to you if you need it for that fireball, just FYI. So the boss fight at level nine is a young blue dragon and Against that young blue dragon, our DTPR would be 22, and our RTD at that rate would be nine. Against uh, the typical fight, that was gonna be four hobgoblin captains. Here, they would on average do 17 damage per round to us, and at that rate, we would survive for 11 rounds. And against a DC 15 level five fireball, 
we would on average take 14 damage per round and at that rate survive for 14 rounds. So we're still in the middle of the pack compared to other tank builds here for attacks against our armor class but we're actually head and shoulders above the rest for elemental damage spells anyway, thanks to resistance from absorb elements combined with our boatload of potential hit points. And hey, I mean, even the middle of the pack is still pretty good. And what other tank gets to suck the blood of their enemies, huh? Answer me that. At level 10, we would be a ranger four, and we get another ability score increase our feet. With our constitution capped, I think I'm probably taking the tough feat here, uh, which just gives us two hit points per level and is just a really nice bump to our beefiness. At level 11, I thought about taking a dip into Forge Cleric here for the plus one armor that it would give us. The reality though is we are a level 11 character. I think in all but the most low magic item campaigns, you probably have at least some plus one armor by now. If I'm wrong, and you don't, and it doesn't look like you're going to get any anytime soon, then I'd maybe consider taking this dip. I know it's only a plus one to AC, but every little bit truly does help. And there are some other benefits to Cleric, to boot, of course. Oh, and for those who are thinking that Forge Cleric would have been an easy way to make our bite attacks magical, because Forge Clerics can imbue a simple weapon, and our bite is technically a simple weapon, um, making it a plus one magic item, essentially. See my earlier comment about Jeremy Crawford saying that body parts aren't meant to count for these kinds of things. Again, your DM may rule otherwise, and if so, Go ahead and stick, I guess, like a metal grill in your mouth <laughs> to give that bite the plus one to attack and hit and the magic property. As for us, we're going to stick with fighter and ranger. And for now, I want to go back to fighter for a bit to pick up a couple of things. First of all, as a battle master at level seven, we get know your enemy. This is a cool and fun ability from battle master. It could potentially benefit you in combat as well as maybe utility wise. If you spend one minute outside of combat, observing someone, you can learn if they are your superior, inferior, or equal in two of a number of things like ability scores, hit points, uh, armor class, etc. You won't very often, I don't think, get a chance to use this in most fights, but when you do, it'll be really nice to have. And then, maybe more importantly for us, we do get a fifth superiority die now, so that means one more goading taunt on a target, uh, more damage, and potentially more healing if we stack it with our empowered bite as soon as our proficiency bonus gets up to five. And that'll be really nice. At level 12, we would be a fighter eight, and we get another ability score increase or feat here. And I'm going to take heavy armor master. I've been wanting this for a really long time. Honestly, it gives us a plus one to our strength and then damage from non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, slashing damage when we're wearing heavy armor, which we are, is reduced by three. That's not a ton, of course, but it really does add up, especially when you're in a situation where the danger is like death by a thousand cuts, as opposed to like a few really big hits. Also, do keep in mind that the vast majority of enemies in D&D deal non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. So this can still be a very useful feat, even into the late game. At level 13, we would be a fighter 9, and we get indomitable. This feature is okay. It lets us reroll a saving throw that we fail once per day. The once per day thing really frustrates me. Uh, and not only that, but if we have a low saving throw score, like our dexterity saving throw right now, which is still just a plus one, because we only have a 13 dex, being able to re-roll if we fail is still not going to have a really high likelihood of succeeding. I mean, obviously it does give us a statistical bump, but it's not a huge one. But hey, it's still beneficial, so we'll take it. For our level 13 damage report then, we've gained some nice additional survivability features with tough and heavy armor master. Indomitable also gives us a chance to re-roll a failed save against the fireball. And our proficiency bonus now does increase here at level 13 for one more empowered bite, just in time to benefit from that additional superiority die that we gained, meaning that we have five of each now, both superiority die and uh, you know empowered bite. So the total potential self-healing that we could do in a single combat encounter would be 100 hit points on average, bringing our grand total hit points right now to a potential 273, which is a lot of hit points. Oh, and one thing I haven't mentioned, yes, if you crit on an empowered bite with all of these additional modifiers that all add weapon damage, then yes, you could potentially heal for a lot more as well because you're just rolling a lot more damage 
and therefore healing potentially. I don't feel like trying to allow for that here, as it's hard to know if when you crit, are you still going to have uses of your Empowered Bite? How about your Superiority Die? Have you used your Hunter's Prey yet this turn? Etc, etc. But sure, some people like to try to get like Hold Person on a Dampier or take Hexblade levels or Champion Fighter levels to increase their crit rate. And I think it's worth considering, but just maybe not for this build. Anyways. The boss fight at level 13 for our damage report was an adult white dragon, and against that adult white dragon, we would take 23 damage per round on average, and at that rate, we would survive for 12 rounds. The typical fight was against five helmed horrors, and our DTPR there was 22, with an RTD of 13, and against a level 7 DC 16 fireball, we would take 16 damage per round on average, and at that rate, we would survive for 18 rounds. Okay, so compared to other tank builds, we're actually a little worse than most of them now on the boss fight in particular, but we're much better than most of them still against the fireball, against the elemental and dex-based damage spells, and middle of the pack for the typical fight at level 14. I think at this point, if the game is still going, you could absolutely just stick with fighter. It's tempting because we could get a little more damage and potential healing out of our superiority dice as they would go to d10s at the next level of fighter and then of course there's the almighty third attack that fighters get at level 11 right after that of course if we were more concerned about our damage we would go that route unquestionably the reality is however that this character wouldn't actually do a ton more damage with a third attack. When you're not using your superiority die and your Hunter's Prey feature, we're talking 1d4 plus 5 plus 1d6 from Hunter's Mark for a total of 11 damage on average. As a level 14 character, that's just not a ton. I mean, it's definitely not nothing. And of course, if you have a nice one-handed magic weapon that you're using when you're not biting, the damage increases. But since we're trying to build for survivability here, I'm going to go back to Ranger now for a couple of reasons. And extra attack is not one of them because, yeah, at Ranger level 5, we get extra attack. I hate redundancy in my builds. It's rare that I will do a build with two martial classes that both go to level 5, but here we are. But take heart, because that's not the only thing that rangers get at level 5. Uh, we get second level spells, too. There's nothing here as a, as a ranger for second level spells that really improve our survivability, I don't think. But there are some good utility and support options for sure. So pick your favorites. And frankly, just getting three more spell slots here is a very welcome increase for additional uses of Hunter's Mark, among other things. And don't forget as well that you get Beast Sense for free once per day thanks to Primal Awareness. At level 15, we would be a Ranger 6. We get Roving from the Deft Explorer feature, and it gives us 5 feet more of move speed for a total of 40 now, which is really quite nice. And Climb and Swim Speed equal to our move speed. Of course, Dampier has already had that uh, for climbing at least, but not for swimming, so that will come in handy once in a blue moon. We'll take it. Just FYI, two favored foe now goes to 1d6 on the off chance that you're using it once in a while, maybe if you're out of spell slots, etc. At level 16, we would be a ranger 7, and as a hunter, we get defensive tactics, and this is the main reason why I wanted to stick with ranger, actually. Well, that and the fact that I think hunters make a great fit for someone who wants to be a vampire. So defensive tactics lets us choose between three different defensive options, and I think the best one here for us is going to be multi-attack defense. Multi-attack defense tells us that when a creature hits you with an attack, you gain a plus four to your armor class against all subsequent attacks made by that creature for the rest of the turn. At this point in the game, almost every enemy that makes attacks makes multiple attacks. Of course, now this won't always come in handy, right? They might miss you on their first attack and then hit you with their second attack and then be done. Meaning that, you know, you didn't benefit on the first attack, then they hit you with the second attack, you got an armor increase, but they're not attacking you anymore, and that plus four AC bonus only works on attacks from that creature on that turn. But there will be plenty of times when having this is going to cause a second and maybe even third attack from enemies to miss you when they otherwise would have hit. And that means great things for our survivability. 
The best part is that it requires no reaction or anything from us. There's no limit on how often you can benefit from it. It's just always on, and I love it for that. And then finally, for us at level 17, we would be a Ranger 8. We get Lands Stride. Uh, I mean, moving through non-magical difficult terrain doesn't slow you, and you have advantage on magical plants that are trying to slow you. I, I love the stuff that they try to give rangers for like thematic purposes, but so much of it is so niche or niche that it just ends up being totally worthless most of the time. Thank goodness for those changes from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. <laughs> but then also we do get our final ability score increase or feat, and I want to take the piercer feat. Some of you may have expected this to come sooner. Partly the reason that I want it is because we're sitting at a 17 strength score and that really bugs me. So we get a plus one strength here to bump us to 18, which is nice. And that means better grapple checks, among other things, you know, potentially more damage if you've got a great one-handed magic weapon. In addition, of course, with the piercer feet, it will increase the damage of our bite attacks ever so slightly. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with piercing damage, you can reroll one of the attack's damage dice and must use the new roll. This is statistically only going to bump our damage by a about one per turn if we round. So not much, but that does mean six more potential healing since we have a proficiency bonus of six now. So we get six empowered bites. Also, when you score a critical hit that deals piercing damage, you can roll one additional damage die. Another small bump on average. And so for our final damage report then, the only real gains that we've had since our last check is that multi-attack defense, um, a little more damage and potential healing from Piercer, and another empowered attack since our proficiency bonus went up. So our armor class is 21, but 25 on subsequent attacks if an enemy hits us beforehand and then keeps trying to hit us afterwards. One thing to note, even though our proficiency bonus did go up, which means more, one more empowered bite per day, we still only have five possible superiority dice in a single combat, which means the total potential self-healing when you include the Piercer feat and six empowered bites, five of them with a superiority die, would be 122 hit points of self-healing on average, bringing our grand total hit points here to a potential 347 beefcake. The boss fight then at this damage report was going to be an adult red dragon, and our DTPR against them would be 31, our RTD would be 12. The typical fight was against five earth elementals, and they would do 44 damage to us on average per round and so our rounds to die would be eight and then against not a fireball we're level 17 we're going up against meteor swarm here which is devastating we would take 82 damage on average and at that rate we would survive for five rounds hopefully none of our enemies have five ninth level spell slots okay so we are kind of near the bottom of the pack now across the board when compared to other tank builds that I've done, unfortunately. Most of us aren't playing the game at level 17 anymore, so I don't think that's a huge deal as far as the viability of this character. But let's discuss it further in Final Thoughts. So the relatively low armor class is the big difference maker for our late game survivability for sure. With, with no access to things like shield, etc. That was one thing that would have made the Swords Bard a little bit better for us, especially as we get into later game. I would still contend that you've got really solid survivability regardless. And of course the reality is that you will almost assuredly have magical armor, magical shield, maybe even like a cloak of protection or a ring of protection or something, right? Which will bump our survivability significantly, right? I'm really not that worried about your ability to tank for your team here, even at high level, and being able to do so while fulfilling your wildest vampiric fantasies. To be honest, I assumed when I first started creating this character that our survivability would be a lot lower than it ended up being. I kind of figured, you know what, that's okay, maybe we're a little bit more of a bruiser, hard to kill if not necessarily like a really tanky tank with some decent burst damage capabilities. I mean it turns out that our longevity was a lot better than I thought, which was a pleasant surprise. In the end, I was super pleased with how it turned out. Um, I had a lot of fun creating the character. I hope you had a lot of fun watching, and that's the end of the show. So, happy Halloween. I love you guys. 
and I am so grateful for all of your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Please do like and subscribe and consider joining the channel if you would, but I hope you have a fantastic day. I hope to see you soon. Check out the other content in the channel and yeah, take care. Bye. Um, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> ah, stop it. Stop it. No, don't say that. <sighs> Dang it. So make, dang it. That could change the numbers. Oh.